Okay. So, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you, Pat, after all these years, knowing each other for 30 years and so. Um, and uh, I'd like to start, you obviously have a very interesting family background, start with your family, parents, um, childhood and early education, um, mm -hmm. anything you'd like to say about that? Right, well, um, I came from, uh, on both sides of my family, quite an ordinary, um, sort of respectable working class, lower middle class background, and neither of my parents uh, went to university. Indeed, my father left school at 14 and my mother at 16. Um, but both of them felt that they would have liked to have had a much better education, and so they were incredibly supportive of me and my two sisters. And I suppose, in, to some extent, our, uh, my academic achievements, such as they are, were kind of done vicariously for them. But I did have a role model, and that was my mother's very much younger brother, a kind of afterthought child, who, um, by the time he was born, the family had moved up a little bit in the world. There was a bit more money. And so he went to Oxford, and he got a first in PPE. Um, and he was the one who was always quoted and held up as the shining light of the family. So from a very early age, uh, when people asked me, what are you going to do when you grow up? <laughs> I would say, I'm going to go to Oxford like Uncle Walter. Um, the other thing about my family, for all it was um, not terribly well to do, was the links with empire. And I think it's very interesting uh, the extent to which the empire during the early part of what well, during the 19th and early 20th century impinged on the lives of quite ordinary people. For example, my father's father went to India during the First World War. He was conscripted or he volunteered, I don't know which, and he was in a number of the places that I know very well. And then his youngest son, my father's younger brother, also was in India um, just after the Second World War. He was too young to fight in the Second World War, but he was posted there in the Air Force. Um, and so, and then of course I was in India and our children have been in India. So, so there was always that link. Um, and people talked about being, for example, in India. Um, I had another uncle, my mother's, yeah, my mother's older brother, who was in Ethiopia and who brought back uh, an extremely useful item that we, we three girls christened the camel stick. And when our parents went out in the evening, when they, we were old enough to be left, we, we were always a bit nervous, so we always had the camel stick handy. And actually, my youngest sister still has the camel stick, because she says she's still nervous <laughs> in the evening. So. Uh, and then there were objects around that they, these people had brought back from their travels, like um, there's a lamp over there, which is shaped like a, a lotus. That came from India, and it was always part of my childhood. Um, and, um, you know, remembering it being there. So the notion that even ordinary people who wouldn't have gone abroad for holidays at that time when I was growing up, nonetheless went to places like India or Ethiopia, or in the case of my grandmother who'd been born in Australia and then her family moved back, and then the uncle who'd been in Ethiopia went to live in South Africa for a while with his wife, and then he went to Canada and the United States. So there were these links all over the world, and the idea that it was, it was possible to travel and to travel and live uh, very far away, um, it didn't seem, seem strange at all. Anyway, I was born in uh, Neston on the Wirral because um, my parents were living in Wallasey, which is where my grandparents had moved out to. My, my mother's parents um, had been part of a very large Liverpool working class family living near the docks. But eventually, my grandfather, who was a printer on the Liverpool Post and Echo, and printing was a very skilled trade and quite well paid in those days, eventually they moved uh, across the Mersey to Wallasey. And so, and my parents at the time I was born were, were living there. But uh, the nursing home was evacuated because it was during the war in 1942. Um, so the very early years we spent living in Cheshire. And then my father, who was a journalist, got a job on the um, uh, Staffordshire Sentinel. And we moved back to his home area, which was a town called Leek, a small market town uh, in the moorlands of Staffordshire and I went to primary school there. And then he got posted, he got another job on the Birmingham Post, and so we moved to Birmingham, and that was where I finished primary school, and then I went to a girls' grammar school called Kings Norton, which um, 
I think probably gave me a pretty good education. It was very much in the sort of single sex grammar school mold. Uh, so if you wanted to, you did Latin and Greek and French and German and all the usual subjects. Um, Were there any special teachers? In the, in the yes, there was one teacher who I think did was very charismatic and did inspire me more than the others, although there were a number who were very influential. Uh, and she was, she, she was my French teacher, and I, French was one of the subjects I did at A-level. And it was assumed that I would go to university and do languages. And by this time, I decided that I wanted to do something different and out of the ordinary. So I started ploughing through the um, university brochures and I came across this degree in African studies. And when I mentioned this at school, everybody threw up their hands in horror and said, you know, what on earth does this girl want to go to London and do African studies for? Anyway, my French teacher was quite enterprising and she found out that SOAS, because it was a degree at SOAS, was having an open day. So she decided she'd go along and um, at this open day she met the then registrar who was a very formidable woman called Catherine something, I can't remember her surname, uh, and she began to talk to her and discovered that they had been at Oxford at the same time. So she then came back and said it was perfectly all right to do African <laughs> studies because there were respectable people involved. And so that was, um, that was okay. So I put into SOAS, and in those days, um, SOAS had uh, certain scholarships for undergraduates. They had one or two competitive scholarships, and they offered me a competitive award. And so I um, uh, abandoned all the other uh, irons that I had in the fire to do philosophy or psychology or whatever in other places, and accepted the place um, at SOAS. And the other thing that um, I think clinched it for me was that the person who interviewed me at SOAS was uh, one of the Swahili teachers who was called Wilfred Whiteley. And he had also been trained in anthropology, although his interest was primi primarily in sociolinguistics. And so we talked at great length uh, during the course of my interview. Um, and I had already written the uh, essays and done the exam for the competitive scholarship. And then he let out that he had a very similar background to mine, namely that he also came from Birmingham and that he came from a Methodist family and his father was also a Methodist local preacher. And so I suppose maybe subconsciously or maybe consciously I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So I went to SOAS. Um, there weren't gap years in those days. This was 1960 and certainly my parents couldn't have afforded for me to take a year out and swan around. So I went straight from school to university and did the African Studies degree, which was relatively new at that time. Um, I was one of only four students doing the Swahili branch. There were two others doing Hausa and one doing Zulu. So there were just seven of us. Um, and it was, as I said, a very new degree. There weren't very many anthropologists in those days. The department had only recently started and we actually used to do most of our lectures down at the LSE. So we got very fit running up and down Kingsway between uh, Russell Square where SOAS was and uh, the Aldwych area where the LSE was. So I went to lectures by Firth and Shapira and uh, Lucy Mayer and all the LSE crowd. But we also had some of our classes and the, the more class and tutorial stuff we did at SOAS. So in the uh, first two years I was taught by a very interesting character called Michael Mendelssohn who had been educated in France and whose real passion was French structuralism. Um, and uh, I think we spent a whole year reading Durkheim and doing not much else. So I can't say that my education was as broad as perhaps it should have been, but it was, it was interesting nonetheless. And then in the third year, by this time, Philip Gulliver, who was an Africanist, had joined the department and uh, he and I got on very well and he eventually became my supervisor. So I finished my degree, and in my final year I'd met Lionel, um, who was then going off to do his research in Nepal. So after I finished the BA degree, I went on to do the Masters. Um, but I didn't have any money, so I had to work my way through. I didn't have a scholarship for those uh, two years, or at least not for the first year. So I looked around to see what I could do to make money, and. Um, I finally found a job in Pimlico teaching French in a boys' school, and they'd never been taught any French before, and they were, um, well, they were pretty naughty, actually. So I taught the first three years French um, and had a, quite a, an interesting time. 
Um, I did that on a part-time basis, and then the rest of the time I, I did my master's degree and I wrote a thesis. And what was the thesis on? The thesis was on land tenure. Um, on both the did land tenure. We both did. We, well, the, uh, the, quite coincidentally, um, the land tenure systems on the coast of East Africa and on the islands were very interesting, and there were lots of bits and pieces of information here, there, and everywhere. And this was also a period when anthropologists were quite interested in land tenure. Max Gluckman was writing his famous stuff, and there were a few other people working on the subject. So anyway, I did this thesis. You had to do a 60,000 word thesis at that time to complete. And then they did give me some money in the second year, so I didn't have to teach the naughty boys in, in Pimlico anymore. Um, and I finished that degree, and uh, in the meanwhile, Lionel had gone off to Nepal, so uh, he, he wasn't around during that period. And then I put in for scholarships to do uh, a PhD and to go to, uh, to work in Tanzania. I should say that um, uh, Professor Wilfred Whiteley, who I mentioned already, was instrumental in getting me a placement uh, in Tanzania at the end of my second year as an undergraduate. He knew the um, archaeologist Neville Chittick, who did some of the pioneering archaeological work on the coast of East Africa, and at the time, 1962 it was, he was working on an, an island called Kiliwakisiwani, so he put me in touch with him and I was offered a, a sort of volunteer placement with food and pocket money. And I went off and spent the summer in, uh, in Tanzania, part of it in Kilwa and part of it traveling around East Africa. Uh, and when I left Kilwa, <coughs> um, I'd come down by vehicle, by Land Rover with Neville and his wife. But um, an Italian, a little Italian tramp steamer came by and uh, they were going up the coast to Mombasa, which was my next destination. So I hitched a lift with this, uh, and it's quite unthinkable now, I imagine, a young woman of 19 traipsing around like that. Anyway, um, they gave me a lift and we, we sailed off to Mombasa with a journey that took several days. And one night we were passing this island and I said to the captain, what's that place? And he said, that's Mafia. And I said, oh, what's there? And he said, oh, people don't know much about it. So I was intrigued because I suppose it was a kind of genre of anthropology that you wanted to find your own little bit of um, supposedly undiscovered territory. So when I came back to London, I started um, checking up on Mafia and I went to the British Library and various other places. And it was true, there was very, very little written about it. So I said to my supervisor, why don't I go to Mafia? And he said, yes, good idea. And you can check up on the kinship system and the <laughs> land tenure system and all the rest of it. So that's what I did. So uh, in did 19... Did you have any training before you went out to do your field work? You know, in those days, very, very little. Um, it was assumed that you'd picked up everything you needed to know um, as you went along. I think my supervisor gave me various bits and pieces of advice and he also wrote me very long letters when I was in the field and I used to send him regular reports and he'd make very detailed comments. So that, that was really helpful, but if you mean the kind of training that I've, well, I mean, we, we put our um, research postgraduates through today, absolutely not, no. Very, very, very little. I mean, the, the major piece of training I suppose I had had is that I'd written, uh, you know, a 60,000 word thesis, which meant that I knew how to go about dealing with a sustained piece of writing. But as for arriving in the field and knowing what to do, nothing in terms of anthropology. However, what I had done, um, I'd always wanted to travel. So when I was 14, I persuaded my parents that I could be um, a, a French exchange could be organized for me so I went and lived in with a French family for a month and that was my first experience of living in a completely different world it was Paris and they were a very different sort of family to my own and the food was different everything was different and then the following year I did an exchange with a German family and I lived in North Germany for a month and then um, when I, the year that I finished my schooling, I went to Italy for three months and worked as an au pair because I wanted to learn Italian. And the year after that, I went to Spain and did a Spanish course. And then uh, a couple of years later, I worked on the kibbutz in Israel. So in other words, when I went to Mafia, I'd already had at least some experience of living abroad and living with families 
that were different from my own, eating different foods, speaking a different language. And I think that was actually incredibly helpful because I'd been forced to confront all these issues of difference and uh, adaptation, just getting on with whatever was around. Um, but I do sometimes wish when I think how amazingly well our students are trained now that some of that training had been available to me uh, and to other students who were you know, my peers at the time, but it wasn't. Thank you. Well, that was marvellous. Um, just to give you one second's break, um, it's often nice if what you can recall your first impressions when you Alanowski famously yes, described I know. his yes, uh, yes. landing on the beach mm, yes, and how absolutely. he was going to invent this place and so on. Can you remember the first days or months of Mafia? Well, I think what, um, one of the things that I always feel is a pity is that very few anthropologists write about the process of getting there because you don't suddenly go from your home site or your university to the field where you're going to do your research you have to pass all sorts of places along the way. You have to get your permission. You have to organize whatever you're going to take with you. Um, you have to make contact with various people, usually in the capital of the country that you're going to work in. So, of course, I had to do all of those things. And uh, I was very fortunate because the University of Dar es Salaam was very hospitable. And uh, as it happened again here, Wilfred Whiteley came in. He was uh, there for a number of years. He'd been seconded there to the new University of Dar es Salaam to he help to set up the Swahili department. So he was there, and that was a very good base, and he, he and his wife were, were helpful and hospitable. Um, anyway, I, I must have spent a couple of weeks in Dar es Salaam getting myself organized and finding out what I needed to find out and booking my ticket to go to Mafia. Now, Mafia is only 80 miles south of Dar, but there are only two ways to get there. One is to fly, and the other is to go by an almost non-existent road, packed in a lorry with probably a hundred other people, to the nearest point on the mainland from Mafia, which is called Kisiju, and then you catch a dhow, um, and you may have to wait a while if there isn't one to hand. So, usually, people would if they could afford it, would choose to fly. So anyway, I booked my tickets on the plane, and it was a, a very, very tiny plane. Um, in fact, the planes that go there now are still very small because it's only a dirt strip uh, of a landing field. So I remember distinctly feeling extremely alarmed because in this small plane, I think it was a five or six seater, the door to the um, cockpit was open. And we took off from Dar es Salaam, and then the pilot got out his newspaper and read it for the rest of the <laughs> way. <laughs> and I thought, shouldn't he be concentrating more <laughs> on flying this plane? And of course I realized now that he just had to set the direction and then he could lean back for half an hour and then he, you know, he had to land the thing. And that's pretty much still how you get there. And when I was there last uh, in 2002, for the first time I took a video camera and I filmed the flight across and the landing, which is exceedingly bumpy. And in a video that we've made, uh, the student and I made of this, uh, all the stuff, the footage, that's, that's the opening sequence, how you get to Mafia. Um, in those days, Mafia, like most places in East Africa, had quite a large Indian community. And uh, it also had one or two Europeans running coconut plantations. So I had been put in touch in Dar es Salaam with uh, a family that owned a coconut, a large coconut plantation on Mafia, who in turn had passed me on. And this was one of the interesting things about the immediate post-colonial period. You, you were kind of passed on from one person to another, and it was almost like a sacred trust. People felt that you had to be looked after. You know, if you were one of us, then people would give you amazing hospitality and really put themselves out. Anyway, um, this family, which was called Stanley, passed me on to a Goan family who rented me a room in their house in the district capital while I decided exactly where I was going to work and what I was going to do and made my obeisance to the district commissioner and so on and so forth. So I stayed in the district capital for a month and whenever I could get a lift I'd go about the island looking at various sites that I thought I might be able to do my research in. And in the end, as usual, it was quite serendipitous, which is that there was a house vacant uh, in an island in the north, uh, in a village in the north of the island called Kanga, uh, 
and the man who owned it, who was an Arab trader, was willing to rent it out to me. So that was where I landed up, and that's where I've continued to go for nearly 40 years, although I have lived and worked in some of the other villages on Mafia. So that first month being in Kilindoni, the capital, was, was very interesting. It was a kind of halfway house, I suppose. Uh, I was very well looked after. I didn't have to worry about cooking and finding my own supplies and stuff like that. So it was a kind of gentle way of, uh, of getting in. And then <clears throat> when I moved up to the village, um, I had been told that I had to have, this was 1965, I had to have a cook. Um, and I can't remember quite how this man, who was called Salam Ali, turned up. But anyway, he became he became my minder, really. That's how I would phrase him. He, he did cook food, it's true. But he also organized things. Um, he told me off when I was being stupid, which of course I was quite frequently. And fortunately, he had a number, he knew pe one or two people up in the north. He was from the south, but he knew one or two people up in the north. And most particularly, he, he knew a friend, he had a friend called Ahmed, who had been um, a mate of his when they'd both been doing the dows. They'd been sailing the dows up and down the coast when they were youngsters, probably late teens, early twenties. So um, Ahmed became a very, very frequent visitor to our house, and then I got very involved with Ahmed's family. And in fact, uh, Ahmed turned out to be the person I eventually wrote the book African Voices, African Lives about many, many years later. So that was a, an important contact, but I still have an entry. I kept a diary, of course, as we, uh, we had been instructed to keep diaries. Uh, and I report that on the first day, I walked out into the village and um, I stopped at the first house. And those people have actually remained my very good and dear friends for many, many years, and well, till today. Um, and sat down and started to, to talk to them and ask them a few questions. I think the enormous advantage that I had was that I'd done the degree in African studies and so my Swahili was quite fluent, reasonably fluent. I mean, obviously it improved as I stayed on in the village. But I wasn't floundering around and I didn't need uh, an interpreter. I could operate uh, on my own. So, um, so that was how it started. And I ended up staying on Mafia for 18 months, although I went to live in two other villages, one village for three months, one na neighboring village for just a couple of weeks. And each time I'd go to another village and come back to Kanga, people would look at me and say, you must have had a terrible time, you've lost so much weight, we told you not to go there, you should stay here, it suits you much better. <laughs> what, what was the central, I mean in those days we were told to study everything, and everything was relevant in the mm. total uh, studies, but uh, what was the central theme of what you were interested in and were looking at? Well, what it had been suggested, um, I sort of, I've been strongly steered, shall I put it that way, in the direction of a, a studies of kinship, because that was the heyday of um, unila unilineal um, descent systems and, and all the rest of it. And yet there was certain evidence, uh, rather fragmentary evidence, to suggest that this system didn't operated very differently, that there was a different kind of kinship and descent system on the coast of East Africa. Um, so uh, my supervisor was extremely interested in, in kinship and descent and he'd uh, written quite a bit about it himself. He, he wrote a, a, a rather good thing on a people called the Indende Uli who didn't have unilineal descent groups. So he said, come on Pat, you know, you find out what they've got there and uh, see if you can, can find something a bit different. So that was very much what I focused on initially, but um, as I think very often happens when you get into the field, something else also obtrudes on your notice and you, you just can't ignore it. And for me that was uh, to do with spirit possession and healing through, through Ngoma, spirit possession rituals. So I spent a lot of time going to those and talking to shamans and healers and diviners. But in the end I wrote my PhD thesis on, uh, it's called non unilingual Descent, on Mafia Island, Tanzania. And then I published it later as a book called Choice and Constraint because I didn't really think that non-unilineal <laughs> <laughs> descent was going to be a very catchy title. Um, so those, those were the two major areas that I looked at in that first period that I was there. So after that you came back to SOAS to write up your PhD. Um, and this was a, 
period which Lionel's talked about and many people as a great expansion of the academic world and, and university life and so on. Did you come back to, to, to find that you are in demand for academic posts or did you have to struggle oh. on for a while? Mm -hmm. That's a, a very, very appropriate question. Um, I had always been told by my supervisor and various other people at SOAS that you know the world was my oyster and once I'd got my PhD I could do anything, go anywhere. And I suppose I'd rather naively believed that. Um, when I came back I rapidly realized that it was actually quite different if you were female. In SOAS um, a lot of the my male peers were offered lectureships or they were helped to get lectureships elsewhere. None of the women did this happen to. Now the year that um, I did my PhD, there was actually three of us, and all of us were Phil Gulliver's supervisees, and we were all female. And there was another woman, Ursula Sharma, who was Freddie Bailey's supervisee. Not one of us was, was it even hinted that you know it might be nice to hang on to you. And also by this time, um, Lionel and I had pretty much decided that we wanted to make a commitment. And so um, there was this awkward business of, do you tell the supervisor that you're thinking of um, getting married? And for a long time, I didn't want anybody to know about this, not because I was ashamed of Lionel or didn't love him dearly, but because I was afraid that it would be the kiss of death to being taken seriously as an anthropologist. Anyway, finally, when, we, when I came back, we did get married, and obviously by this time I had told my supervisor that I was going to get married, and uh, Lionel was already a member of staff of the department. So the question was, how were we going to organize a, a dual, dual career, a two-career family? Um, well, I wrote my PhD in what I suppose in those days was commendably record time. I think I came back in March, and I'd handed it in 18 months later and was examined and it was passed and that was all fine. But in the meanwhile, um, Lionel had been offered the opportunity to go back to Nepal where he'd done his first field work to do another study. And so he said, you know, why don't you come along as well and why not have another string to your bow? So I went to classes in Nepali at SOAS and started reading up on Nepal as well as working on the East Africa stuff. And we set off for, um, we left uh, Britain at the end of um, 1968, just after I finished my PhD, stopping off in uh, Turkey and Iran. And then we arrived in Delhi and uh, got ourselves organized to go up into the middle hills of Nepal, uh, which was a, a very interesting um, and not always very easy experience. My Nepali wasn't very good, whereas obviously Lionel was extremely fluent. And so for the first time, I found myself in the field in a much more dependent position than I was used to. And I didn't, I had just hadn't had time to read up masses about caste and purity and pollution. So I did make some awful errors that I blush to remember now in terms of you know, how you behave, body language, food and stuff like that. But anyway, um, we, we went to this place in the far western hills uh, called Dilek and Lionel wanted to do a study of a bizarre town and I uh, wanted to, to work in, in a village. So I, we lived in the bizarre town, um, we shared a house, but I had a little house in the village or a room in a house in the village where I would be sometimes. Um, but mostly I walked the two miles back and forth and uh, did this study of um, caste relations in this village in Nepal and we were there we were in Nepal for a year, but um, we were out of the field for a period of about two months because Lionel was quite ill in the middle and had to be dramatically helicoptered out. And so we had to go back to Kathmandu and he had an operation and then when he'd recovered we came back and finished off the field work. And then on the way back we, um, we met some people in Kathmandu, some, I think they were Germans, and we were sitting over supper one night and uh, saying, oh, well, we're going back soon and we, we'd like to stop off somewhere on the way. Anybody got any bright ideas between here and the UK? And somebody said, oh, go to Madras, it's wonderful. I'll give you a contact. So we said, okay. And in those days, you provided it was within your mileage limits, you could stop off anywhere you liked. 
So we booked our, ourselves back via Madras and we looked up this contact who turned out to be the head of the tourist board in Madras who took us in charge, told us where to go, what to see, what music, what concerts and we were just completely smitten. So later, four years later, five years later when we were thinking about our next field trip that was where we decided that we would go. We wanted to do an urban study, we didn't want to take small children of whom we had two by then back up into the hills of Nepal or off to the uh, island of Mafia, so we all set off for Madras in 1974. Thank you. Were there any, just recapping a little bit, um, were there any anthropologists or others who apart from Philip Culliver, who you've mentioned, who had, a, up to this point in time, had had a big influence on you, either theoretically or personally. Um, were you beginning to be, Lionel was influenced by the Manchester group quite a bit. Um, were there East Africanists or general anthropologists mm. who, by this time, were influencing your work? Well, I think, yes, I think the Manchester School was incredibly important, and obviously I read Gluckman and Watson and Epstein and Mitchell and, and all the rest of them and in fact um, recently uh, we were rereading some of the letters that we'd sent to each other when we were in the field, our, our first field trips and I said to Lionel in one letter, uh, I have to have a copy of Gluckman's, um, what's it called, the one about the, the, the bridge, the incident in, uh, on the bridge which is this sort of case study that he builds this whole notion upon. So he must have sent that out to me. And another letter said, and can you get me Mitchell's Kalela dance? And yes, so I mean obviously very aware of that. And then the other person who was coming into great prominence, although his tack was a bit different than the other members of the Manchester School, was Victor Turner and all his work on the Ndembu and Ndembu symbolism. And again, I, because I became interested in spirit possession and ritual and stuff like that, I, I started to read uh, Turner quite extensively. But in terms of people that I actually met, um, not, not terribly much, not, not really. I, when I started to write up the Nepal material, I got interested in Freddie Bailey's work. And then it was then that I, spent a, I sat down and spent a year reading up on caste and um, purity and pollution and all the Indian, well not all, many of the Indian village studies which I hadn't been so familiar with then. Um, and certainly I, I thought Freddie Bailey's work was really good and really interesting. So I suppose that might have influenced a bit the way that I wrote that book on uh, priests and cobblers, it was called. What about Adrian Mayer and the other people at Sellers? Where did they, did you, you maintained your connection presumably with Sellers? Oh, well, my connection with SOAS went on and on and on. Um, in fact, I once counted it up and I had an official designation at SOAS for 15 years because three years for an undergraduate degree, two years because I did it part-time for my master's, three years for the PhD. Then I was on the London Cornell um, Nepal Himalayan project and that was another two years or three years, I can't remember. And then um, SOAS gave me an affiliation to go and do the Madras work, so I was a fellow in the department at SOAS for another two or three years. So I guess they must have thought they'd never get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were glad to keep you, but not to offer you a job. <laughs> but no, certainly not to offer a job, no. But w uh, were there people there? I mean, um, Lionel talked very interestingly about uh, Christophe and um, Adrian and Abner. Were any of these people? And well, uh, you know, you have to understand that when you, I mean, uh, Lionel came in as a mature student, I was a young thing, um, and um, Christoph and Adrian were sort of so far above that, mm -hmm. you know, it, uh, neither of them ever taught me, and I didn't know them terribly well at that period of time, so they didn't, I mean, I had read um, uh, Adrian's book on uh, uh, the village in India, Carston kinship in, in India and thought it you know thought it was very good but um, other than that I, I didn't know him terribly well I mean I I went along to the summer parties and always felt um, a bit nervous and, and and out of place when Avner came um, he was he was really good fun and we all used to go to the pub together and um, 
and then I began to realize you know the that intellectually he was very bright and and his writing was extremely interesting so I certainly read uh, read Abner's stuff but I guess I, I suppose I also always thought of myself as a slight so as LSE hybrid because of the uh, undergraduate things and so I would follow I mean I'd read a lot of Raymond Firth's work in fact I think I was trying to decide the other day which was the very first anthropology book I'd ever read and when I went for this initial interview at SOAS with Wilfred Whiteley he, he um, and I was offered the post the place and I said to him what shall I read I can read this summer you know I've finished school I've got a lot of time and he sent me a list and the two things that stick out in my mind are Raymond Firth's Human Types which has been in print since the 1930s mm. amazing um, and Ruth Benedict's The Chrysanthemum and the Sword. So I can't remember which of those two I read first, but anyway, I certainly remember reading those. And then I read lots more of, uh, of Raymond's stuff. And I always thought Raymond's was very, it was very sensible, it was very comprehensible. Although that was true actually of most anthropologists and the way they wrote in those days, because it was only later that they became uh, so utterly mystificatory, some of them, and in, indulged in um, far too much jargon, in, in my opinion. You say it was very comprehensible and very straightforward. Is that praise or uh, damning with faint praise? Was there, did you find it beyond that? You know, it's really hard to remember how you saw it. Actually, Lionel and I were having a conversation yesterday um, because he came and said, Have I, had I got the very first book that he arrived in this country clutching, uh, which is Ottenberg, yeah. yes. And it's on my shelf because as it happens, I've got all the Africa books on one of the shelves here that we own between us. Um, and I said, what did you get out of Ottenberg? And he said, oh, I remember, uh, he said, I, I read my 40s on unilineal descent groups and nearly went home. <laughs> and I said, don't you remember the first, one of the first times that we met, we were, there was a little workroom in the uh, house that SOAS de Anthropology Department was housed in in those days. It wasn't in the main building, it was in a, a house in Woburn Square. And there was a room that we would sit in, there was a little departmental library. And one day I was sitting there, and there must have been some others there, and Lionel was one of them, and I started to laugh. And Lionel said to me, what are you laughing at? What are you reading? And I said, I'm reading my forces. <laughs> and he said, you mean it's funny? And I said, well, <laughs> you've either got to laugh or cry. <laughs> So it wasn't that it was that difficult, it was just that I, I suppose I was thinking, what on earth are they making all this fuss about? And then of course I became one of these kinship types who also drew diagrams <laughs> and worried about whether it was unilineal or cognatic or double descent or all the rest of it. But that phase didn't last very long because I, 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 I suppose I got rather bored with it and uh, wanted to move on to other things. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I still feel that if you read the, most of the anthropologists that I've cited, Bailey, the Manchester School, Leach, Porters, um, Malinowski, it was stuff that, you know, if you applied your mind to it, you could read it and you could understand it. Nobody was trying to bamboozle you with technical, too many technical terms. I mean, obviously there were some technical terms, but um, I, I thought it was all pretty comprehensible stuff, which is more than you can say few people that we know about today. <laughs> um, just find on, on people, um, East Africanists, uh, about the middle of this time, David Parkin came to mm. Soas, and um, you must have known him, and also whether you want to say anything about my colleague Ray Abrahams, who was another East Africanist. Um, did, did you know them both at all well? Well, I knew David extremely well because we were fellow students, although he was a year ahead of me. And uh, he, he kind of moved ahead more rapidly because he didn't do a master's. I did this master's in between the first degree and the PhD, whereas he shot off to the field pretty soon after he'd finished his, his first degree. And um, so, yes, I mean, I'd known him uh, extremely well at SOAS, and then we, um, when I was in East Africa the first time, we made contact again, so I, you know, I saw him and his then wife, Monica, um, and he was at that time, uh, he worked with Wilfred Whiteley, who, who was running a very big sociolinguistic project on um, multilingualism in East Africa.
And so some of Dave's earliest work was uh, a around that area. He, um, David Parkin only began to work on the coast, and particularly coastal coast as opposed to the immediate hinterland relatively recently, because he did a lot of work on the Luo uh, in Kenya, uh, and then he worked on the Giriyama in the, it must have been the late 60s, when we were working in Nepal, he was working on the Giriyama. Uh, and then more recently, he's actually been working in Zanzibar. Let's move on now to um, your later work. Can you pick out what you think is most interesting in that work? You did the biography or life and Mm, times, personal narrative, yeah. Personal narratives and work on gender. And, mm. um, what What do you think is most significant in the work and most interesting? <laughs> well, of course, it depends uh, who the audience is, doesn't it? When I um, went back to Mafia for the second time in the 1970s, I, I actually went with um, a BBC film crew and they wanted to use the Mafia footage. They were making a series of uh, films with themes or anthropological themes. And the one that I was supposed to work on particularly was the theme of gender, because by the mid-1970s, there was beginning to be considerable interest in the, what it was called in those days, the anthropology of women, which subsequently became the anthropology of gender. Sorry. Um, so from the mid-1970s, for quite a long period, I did do a lot of work on, on gender, both in Tanzania and then the first work that I did in India was on women's organizations, which was also about class and um, about how women managed politics, managed to get politically involved and achieve political power without doing so uh, in an overt way through social welfare organizations. And then I continued to work on that until probably the late 1980s and even into the 1990s. And still, it's, it's a, a theme which I think is extremely important and which informs some of the work that I've uh, done even recently. The other subject that I became very interested in in the um, late 1980s and the early 1990s was the anthropology of food. There was very little written about the anthropology of food, although Mary Douglas had done some extremely important work. But um, when I first tried to put together a course on the anthropology of food, I was drawing on a very multidisciplinary background. I used a lot of historical material, um, social geographers, um, cookbooks, uh, development stuff, all kinds. And I think um, that's a fascinating area because um, looking at food can lead you in so many different directions. I mean, certainly gender was one obvious theme, um, but there were lots of others. It could lead you in, in, into a sort of development um, direction. It could also lead to a study of uh, symbolism and metaphors and, uh, and a sort of more structuralist um, approach. Uh, and so Every area that I've worked, geographical area that I've worked with the exception of Nepal, which I've never gone back to, I've done work on food. In India, I worked very briefly. I had one short trip where I looked at um, something called the Tamil Nadu feeding scheme, which is the largest feeding noon uh, feeding scheme in the world where they run uh, a noon meals uh, uh, scheme for school children and even preschool children. I've more recently done work in India on um, changes in food consumption patterns among the people that I've worked with now for many years, uh, over 20 years, 25 years. So these are middle class um, participants, informants, and uh, looking at the very dramatic changes in the kind of food that they eat and that's available to them and how they do their shopping and stuff like that. On Mafia, I've been increasingly um, concerned about the, um, the deterioration in the food situation and the reasons for this, and this is something that I've been exploring in the latest project that I'm working on now, which is called Local Understandings of Modernity. And then uh, in the, the first half of the 1990s, I directed uh, uh, two large projects on food in Britain, which were part of a big ESRC research program called The Nation's Diet. Uh, which was multidisciplinary, so there were psychologists and um, 
I was the only anthropologist. There were one or two sociologists, uh, social policy people. There were about 10 of us who had projects, and I actually had two projects, one based in Lewisham, which is an inner city area um, in London, and one based in a rural area of West Wales. And there were three research associates working with me. In fact, they collected most of the data, although I did do some data collection myself as well. Um, and what the projects were about was looking at people's understandings of the relationship between food and health. So we were very, very interested in how people made the choices they did, why they made the kind of choices they did, and how this tied in with conventional anthropological interests such as household structure, gender relations, the wider political economy, and how the micro ties in with the macro, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I've still continued to keep an interest in that, and I've, done, I've written a bit and given one or two lectures at conferences on things like, well, I became, from the food, I became interested in the, in the issue of risk because BSE, the first BSE scare happened when we were doing that project. And then, of course, the second BSE scare happened, and there have been multiple food scares, moral panics, whatever you want to call them, along the way. And most recently, the, the major business being, of course, the foot and mouth, and then the ongoing importance of the GMO debate and um, the kinds of differences um, for example, the, you know, the, the, the hostility in, in many parts of Britain and, and Europe can by, compar by comparison with, for example, North America. So I've continued to work on that, and I still, when I go back to Wales, um, I still you know, talk to people about these issues and keep clippings and uh, hope to write more about it one of these days. What would you say, uh, is, is there a thread or theme that connects all these, because you are a very wide-ranging anthropologist, both in your interests and also in, as you know, for me that isn't a criticism, that's a commendation, since I have the same vice. Um, and you're just about as much an, an Asianist as an Africanist, and you've worked, as you indicated, there on many different themes. Um, is there a, a really something behind all this that links them all together? Well, I think that um, I suppose I've always disliked um, the kind of dichotomy that's made between theory and praxis or between um, one's personal life and one's academic life. And since I've taken very particular political positions and stances, I've wanted to carry this through into my work and not see my work as completely divorced from the issues that I think are, are important in my life and, and in the world generally as I see it. And most recently I've become increasingly um, exercised about issues like um, social justice, human rights, ethics. The most recent book that's come out is a, is a book on ethics which I think can be treated as very much a sort of um, well, Marilyn Strathern has called it a form of audit culture, you know, where we fill out our ethics forms and the ethics committee either rubber stamps it or doesn't. Or you can actually deal with ethics in a much more profound way, which is about, you know, what are we really doing and why are we doing it, for whom are we doing it, how should we be doing it? And those much more important questions about what and who anthropology is for. So, yeah, I guess... Um, an attempt, not always very successful, to try to bring those issues in, into my work. Turning to, at the beginning, you said that you had considerable obstacles as a woman mm. getting a job, but later on you became a very successful high-level academic and chairman of the Association of Social Anthropologists and professor at Goldsmiths and so on. How did, how did this happen? What were the steps up the greasy mm. pole? Steps up the <laughs> well, it, it, was, it was a very greasy pole. Well, um, by 1975, when we, uh, we came back from India, we had a five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. And I had published two books. The, I'd written up the Nepal material first. That was a fairly, fairly short book because it was a, a series that um, Phil Gulliver and Dave Parkin were 
trying to get going to rival the um, famous Holt Reinhardt Winston series. I think we, you know, we all thought we were going to make our fortunes as every American university would adopt this. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a good little series. Unfortunately, the publisher was taken over by another publisher and then by another publisher, and I really lost all track of exactly who owns the copyright on all of that material now. Um, and then I'd also finally managed to get my PhD thesis uh, published in 1975. And so I started applying for jobs, and um, it was made very plain to me, in some cases quite overtly, extraordinarily, you know, well, you had two children, and the fact that you had two books, you know, the, the children cancelled out the books. Um, and I remember at one interview in this very city, I won't say which department, I was asked, um, are you really serious about wanting a job? He almost said, dear. He didn't need <laughs> to say it, but... Um, and I said, well, you know, what do you think I'm sitting here for? <laughs> of course I'm serious about wanting a job. So I had applied for several jobs and, um, and, and not been successful and was extremely annoyed about it because I could see other people that had either come along after me or I thought really were not that fantastic, you know, m making it males mostly. And by this time I was also part of, we, we'd formed, we disgruntled women had formed the London Women's Anthropology Group which met monthly to mull over these nefarious doings of our male um, colleagues and patrons and uh, we started having conferences and uh, um, putting out papers and so on and, uh, and the men got terribly nervous. I remember meeting one distinguished Cambridge anthropologist actually um, and I was completely amazed when I realised that they were much more terrified of us than <laughs> we were of them. Uh, I think they thought the revolution was really happening. Anyway, the long and the short of it was that eventually, after uh, about a year and a half of this, getting really rather depressed and feeling this was you know, grossly unfair, um, I landed the job at Goldsmiths. And um, I hadn't known anything about Goldsmiths. There wasn't an anthropology department there in those days. Um, so I'd gone along thinking, well, I don't really think I want to be here. You know, they haven't got any anthropologists apart from the one person who was there, Brian Morris, who was already teaching there. And it was the other end of London, and we just bought a house in northwest London, and Goldsmiths was in southeast London. I don't really think this is the place for me. But anyway, they offered me the job, and I accepted it. And I've stayed there ever since, pretty much with, a f obviously, trips to the field and then a period as a secondment to uh, another institution in the University of London. And uh, fortunately, the only other anthropologist who was there, we were both teaching anthropology to psychology students. The, un the university regulations said in those days that psychology students couldn't just do psychology, they had to do a n other subject. So we were the kind of tame other subject. So we taught hundreds, or at least it felt like hundreds, of psychology students. And uh, Brian and I got on incredibly well, even though our backgrounds were very, very different and we were very different sorts of people. But we decided rapidly that there was no way that that was how we wanted to spend the rest of our lives. What we needed was a department. And since there wasn't one, we'd better create one. And so that was what we set about doing. So um, after a couple of years, we managed to get one more post. And then a year later, we got another post. And then a couple of years later, we got half a post until there were five of us, and then we managed to get a sixth person by dint of somebody had to be away every year, so somebody had to get money every year, and then we got a sort of six permanent temporary. And then we went to Richard Hoggart, who was the then uh, warden of Goldsmiths College. I can still remember going to see him and saying, we want to be independent, we want to move out of the psychology department and be an anthropology department. And he said, don't be so daft which was his typical way of talking. And then finally he said, all right, you can be a unit. So for a year or two we were a unit, and then we started calling ourselves a department, and then I think the wardenship changed, and we just sort of, somehow we became a department. And then we started to grow, and uh, in the last few years the department has grown quite dramatically, so I think there are now 15 or 16 full-time members of staff, and lots of other people around and lots of part-timers and visiting tutors and obviously the student numbers have grown considerably as well since those those early days. So that was all um, incredibly hard work, incredibly interesting, a great deal of fun, 
Um, I think the, the first five of us who were appointed at Goldsmiths were all mavericks in our way. Um, but we knew we had to stick together if we were going to make a go of it, because those were the days when the cuts started biting. I'm talking now the mid-1980s onwards. And Goldsmiths was never a wealthy institution. So um, we, we had to pull together, um, you know, sink or swim. We had to do it together, and, and, and we did. So I, I feel that I was really very privileged to be part of what's become, uh, I don't, this isn't just my opinion, one of the best departments in the country and one of the most interesting departments in the country. As to being female um, within that milieu, the person who took over from Richard Hoggart, Andrew Rutherford, um, was, his background was a Scottish Presbyterian who um, I think had a very strong sense of justice and fair play. And under his uh, period as warden of Goldsmiths, quite an, a, a number of women were either appointed or promoted. And I was actually, the in 1989, the first professor to be um, appointed at Goldsmiths College. And I was incredibly surprised, actually, when he phoned me up and he said, well, they're going to make you a professor. And I said, what, me? Um, <laughs> you know, that, that it's just something I hadn't really thought about very much before. Um, and you have to remember, I think, that in 1989, I think I was one of about three women professors of anthropology in the country. Marilyn, I think, was already a professor then. And there was one other. I can't remember who it Sandra. was now. I don't think it was. It might have been Sandra. Anyway, the numbers were, were really tiny. It was, uh, you know, all the major um, senior posts in anthropology for a long, long time were occupied by men. And things only began to change, I suppose, in the mid-1980s and then more so in the, uh, in the 1990s. And I think there has been uh, an interesting demographic change in the gender balance in anthropology. I, I, I wouldn't claim that it's perfect, but it's certainly infinitely better than it was when I started out. And the kind of questions that uh, one would be asked at interview as a woman that I've heard other people say to me, um, it would be unthinkable. I mean, you simply couldn't get away with it uh, anymore. So I suppose things have improved somewhat to, to that extent. Two final questions. One, I asked Lionel, what, what constraints, what was the title of your book, Constraints? Choice and Constraints. Choice and Constraints does being married to another anthropologist uh, well, uh, shall we say, advantages and constraints. He couldn't think of any constraints to be glad to hear, but um, being married to another anthropologist um, have. Uh, that's one, one short question. Well, the um, I can't think of any disadvantages either. The I remember when I finally got up the nerve to write to my supervisor and I said, Lionel Kaplan and I are going to get married. And he wrote back and said what a nice fellow Lionel was, and you know he thought it, that was a very good idea. But he said, I am concerned that you'll talk about anthropology over the breakfast table, <laughs> um, which I can't say that we, we do very frequently. But we do talk about anthropology. We have always read everything that the other person has written and commented on it. And that's just been an incredible privilege to have somebody who's willing to plow through your, you know, your early drafts, your awful prose. And especially when I was still an, a postgraduate student and writing my thesis and my first book, uh, Lionel was of incredible help. And still, I respect his opinion about whatever I turn out more than anybody else. And if he says this is rubbish, then it gets, you know, as it gets changed or it gets chucked. Um, the one thing that we've never done is that we've never worked together. I mean, we've been in the same locations, but always working on different projects. And we, I've been asked, I mean, we've both been asked on a, num a number of times, why didn't we do what other anthropological couples have done? And we said, well, we're still married after 37 years, <laughs> <laughs> and some of them aren't. So I think that's, that's been a, a good recipe, that we've each had our, our own spheres and done our own thing. And sometimes we've each gone off independently and done our own short bursts of field work, and one's looked after the house and the kids while the other's been away, and that also worked very well. So I, I think I've... As a woman, I've been incredibly fortunate. Um, I can't remember, was it Barbara Ward who said once, if you're a woman to succeed in anthropology, you need good luck, 
good health and a good husband. Um, yes. And I suppose, you know, I've, I've, I've been blessed with, with all of those. The, the last um, question is just really just to see if there's anything that, and many things that we haven't touched on in your life, but if there's anything else that, as they say, when they send fruits over the over the top. Over the top. Is there yes. anything else? Anything else? Right. Um, I should have. No, I, I feel that I'm, I'm coming into a somewhat different phase now where I'm not encumbered with teaching, which I have to say I enjoyed enormously and got tremendous pleasure from and always learnt vast amounts from, from my students. And it's, it's a very renewing and energising thing, but of course it's also very time consuming. And so now having the freedom to do. Um, what I want to do when I want to do it, it's, um, it's terrific. It means I can, I can travel, I can take advantage of invitations, I can do um, field work if, if I feel like it, and I can finally begin to catch up. I think this is one of the problems that you have as an anthropologist if you're fortunate and you get the chance to go and collect data that you never somehow manage to write up everything, or even if you do, as you mature or as anthropology changes, you change, your perspective changes, there are new ways of looking at old material. And so this is the phase that I'm looking forward to now, which is reviewing some of what I've done or what I've collected before, perhaps moving in slightly different directions. So um, yeah, still lots to be done. That's a very nice positive note to end on. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome.